Okay. The recording has started. Okay. okay. I'm speaking about uh, recent progress on the discovery of energy extraction from a clear black hole by discrete black hole quanta in uh, four different uh, GRB. But before that, let me start generally about the background and a characteristic mass which has been extremely important in relativistic astrophysics. Everybody knows the Compton wavelength based on Planck constant and the gravitational length associated to the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole, of a, of a, of a self-gravitating object of mass m. These two quantities dominate practically the classical and the quantum aspect of uh, physics. And it's only when these two quantities become equal that uh, a Planck mass is introduced a mass which differentiate the classical domain from the quantum domain and plays a fundamental role in relativistic astrophysics. I am completely in this book, Einstein, Far Fermi, Eisenberg, and uh, the birth of relativistic astrophysics. In there, I recall some, of course, uh, of the anecdote about uh, Einstein, and I will just mention one, and also about the fundamental role of Enrico Fermi introducing the Thomas Fermi equation for the atom, which is one of the most successful topic in physics. Eugene Wigner, with his Hungarian of, uh, accent, used to say, the Thomas Fermi model works much better than it should. And of course, there I also speak about the work of Heisenberg, especially in connection with Euler. This, all this work has been essential for the birth of uh, preceded the birth of relativistic astrophysics. And um, I will just mention, I will just focus not on all relativistic astrophysics, but on the concept of gravitational collapse. And um, remind a paper, in a two paper, May 10, 1939 by Albert Einstein, where he studied the stationary system of spherically symmetric uh, um, mass, gra self-gravitating, and uh, the uh, paper a few days later of um, Oppenheimer and Snyder looking at the gravitational collapse when an object reach close to the Schwarzschild radio. And of course, all the things that we have learned the fact that the light from the surface of the star is progressively reddened and escape over a progressively narrow range of angles. Einstein was quite skeptical, but it's very interesting, this beautiful work of Einstein, because he studied this uh, cluster, and uh, this paper is still extremely interesting, because there he discovered before uh, becoming so classic work, the unstable uh, orbit uh, at 3M around uh, um, a Schwarzschild solution. The, uh, the starting point of relativistic astrophysics, which uh, we dis I discuss in that book, as practically on gravitational collapse, three fundamental papers. The one by Riccardo Giacconi, Erd Gorski and Paolini and Bruno Rossi, first December 1962, discover a first X-ray source outside the solar system. 
this object is still uh, uh, extremely interesting today. It the is, is not yet uh, totally understood, but it could be very well that precisely the physics uh, on GRB will be leading to the solution of the understanding of COEX-1. The next paper, which was uh, a few uh, months later, was the paper in um, uh, Martin Schmidt um, uh, about the discovery of 3C273. And uh, of course, the first quasar, the enormous energy with the jet, the im uh, the, uh, of this object were uh, uh, introduced there, and uh, the Texas meeting was practically the first Texas meeting triggered by this discovery. And again, only now, probably, I will show some of this point, we are starting to understand in a new way the physics of the jet of this uh, object. The next uh, uh, discovery, of course, was in 1968, the enormous discovery by Tony Uish and Jocelyn Bell, discovering the pulsars. And here there is the beautiful example of the pulsar in the Crab Nebula. And here you have in these 33 um, um, images, just the pulsar optical turning on and off. And this was practically these three results were the one which opened the way of the study of gravitational collapse in relativistic astrophysics from an observational point of view. In these days, uh, I joined uh, the group, group in Princeton in 1971, and uh, with uh, joining the group of John Wheeler, and this is uh, a beautiful picture. And uh, Johnny and uh, all uh, the people, uh, student, uh, really a, a fantastic number, uh, uh, work in Princeton in, the, in, in these days, um, worked on the, on the introducing the black hole. And this was the paper we published with Johnny. And I would like to emphasize that was not just uh, uh, an introduction of a name, was the introduction of a new physical object. And the basic difference from all the preceding work and the one we inaugurated with that paper has been the fact that the, that the black hole find its basis, its conceptual basis, not in a Schwarzschild solution, but in a Kerr solution. And the Kerr solution, with, uh, we understood at the time uh, on the basis also of some pioneering work uh, um, uh, working on the extraction of energy by Roger Penrose, we clarify the region in which in a Kerr solution can occur the energy extraction. And this region we define the ergosphere of the black hole. And there are other aspects, of course, that were essential that we start to draw attention of some of the work of the Russian school of Zeldovich or Shlovsky on a binary uh, system and the possible, possi po possible way to detect a black hole and uh, uh, extracting, this was the dream, the rotational energy of the black hole. But uh, in a few uh, uh, months later, as everybody knows, there has been the work of um, 
de Christodoulou, September 1970, my work with Dimitrius in 1971, March 1st, and March 11 of 1971 was the work of Hawking in Fisrev letter, practically discovering the mass formula which I here represent. The mass is the total mass of the black hole. L is the angular momentum of the black hole. But the most intriguing quantity, which we are still trying to understand today, the physical role, profound role, is the irreducible mass. And uh, <clears throat> from this formula, from the fact that there is an irreducible mass under which we cannot go for any black hole. In the extreme case of L equal M, or if you want uh, A over M equal one, the extractable energy of the black hole, keeping the limit of the reducible mass, can be as high as 29% of the black hole mass. Therefore, the, the quest was to try to use this uh, extractable energy. And, uh, and the quest for doing that has uh, continued since, and only recently has been uh, a different approach to obtain this extraction of energy, has been uh, um, obtained, and I will talk to the, uh, uh, in this talk. Uh, by the way, this is a beautiful picture of uh, Roy Kerr when, after uh, receiving the Crawford Prize in 2016. And after that, we traveled together to England and uh, went to see Stephen Hawking in Cambridge. It was a fantastic meeting. We re-celebrate the mass formula. We discuss about the possibility of also extracting the rotational energy. And um, we had uh, a three days uh, meeting. In the beginning, they told us that it was impossible uh, to meet uh, Stephen. We were ready to leave Cambridge with a, a lot of sadness, but uh, then <laughs> Uh, while we were uh, just chatting in an office, the secretary came and said, Professor Hawking would like to see him, you. And we would look at each other and said, where is he? In the hospital? No, he's in his office. Okay, we went down and we had this uh, fantastic interaction with Stephen, which we, call, call, we recorded uh, practically all the discussion taking picture of the screen of his computer. The day after, Roy and I gave a, a seminar. And then at the end of the seminar, uh, um, Stephen said, well, what about tomorrow? <laughs> he said, well, uh, what about the dinner tomorrow? And this was a very big surprise. We were guests at his house in one of the most beautiful and uh, 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 dinner we had, but also the pleasure to dialogue so long with him. The main topic now being addressed is how to use in an astrophysical process the extractable energy in the crystal dulu working of any black hole mass energy. The goal is to explain the high energy emission in the MEV, in the JEV, and the TEV in four different GRB. They are currently important progress, which will be presented in 2021 in the 50, for the 50th anniversary, which will be next year of introducing the black hole. On the occasion of MG16 in 2000, next year, and we are planning to have a 50 plenary presentation to be broadcasted uh, on this topic. But let's start again on the astrophysics of this. Uh, of this. The fundamental result came uh, from the discovery of binary X-ray sources 
uh, which uh, we obtain co in collaboration with Riccardo Giacconi. Therefore, the first time we have seen a binary system of a normal main sequence star accreting into neutron star. And you, it was clear already since that work that this system was, were necessarily to evolve. And to people asking such a question in the lectures, we answer always well, but it will take at least, at least 10 to the 80 years. We have no time to wait for this evolution. We were wrong because we are missed at the time the concept of induced gravitational collapse in the fact that when this star becomes, uh, uh, goes a supernova and evolves, the accretion on the neutron star companion is so big that the object becomes emitting 10 to the 54 ergs and is uh, visible not only inside our own galaxy like Hercules X1 or Senex3 and so forth, but this enormous energy released in the transition of, in the, uh, from uh, the accretion of a supernova into a neutron star leads to systems which are observable in the entire universe. And uh, then, of course, if you do a computation, you see that although in a galaxy, they are occurring once uh, on time scale of 10 minus uh, 8 per year. If you consider that there are 10 to the 9 galaxies, this object visible in view of their energetic gives a result once a day, roughly. And this is the great discovery which we have done in the in the mean in the meantime and of course this was the result which we did not understand at the time in 1964 of the discovery of gamma ray burst by Klebsedal Strong also um, uh, from the uh, Vila satellite. It took uh, almost uh, uh, from 74 to 96, 24, 25 years after the launch of Beposax to determine the localization of this gamma ray burst in the X-ray. This was the fantastic result of Beposax, which determined the distance of this uh, uh, gamma ray burst for the first time. And then it was clear that we were facing this enormous energy of 10 to the 54 ergs, which we, uh, as an outcome, uh, as I will show, of the evolution of the binary system, which we discover with Riccardo Giacconi. Here are the early observatory and the largest uh, effort ever in determining, uh, in using, uh, 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 optical uh, radio uh, interferometer, X-ray, gamma-ray has opened a new era. And there is no a better era to discuss than the one that we will find in GRB 1901-14C. But let's go back for a moment. The key idea in our approach is that they are, uh, of course, uh, we know, knew all the time that they are short GRB and long GRB. Uh, it was Cuvelliotto that she first made the, this distinction. And here we present an update of this, this difference where the short GRB and the long GRB are uh, represented. The only difference of the two diagram is that we use in this diagram a rest frame description in the sources by which the difference between the short and the long gamma ray burst is not two seconds as traditionally thought, but 0 0.75 seconds. And this is one of the great contributions of Wang Yu. But let's go back a moment how the GRB were discovered. The first proposal 
relating, relating GRB to astrophysical cosmological sources was the vision of Zoltan Pashinsky and co author a co worker. Uh, Pashinsky, uh, uh, Mao, uh, the two Chinese collaborators of um, uh, uh, Lee, uh, of Pashinsky, and of course, Narayan, Piran, Shemi, and uh, uh, other people who understood that uh, new, uh, short GRB are necessarily um, in binary system of neutron star. The tradition, what about long GRBs? The traditional model is that long GRBs, uh, um, and the traditional model has been practically following the path of uh, Ries, Mezzaros, Woosley, and the idea of the collapser, is uh, that they assume a single star, a single star emitting an ultra relativistic blast wave with the Lorentz gamma factor of 10 to the 3 described by the Blanc for an MRT solution. This kinetic energy of the ultra relativistic blast wave is release, released under, uh, assumed to be released on synchrotron a distance of 10 to the 16, 10 to the 18 centimeter from the black hole. In our approach, we assume that we assume that all G long GRB, not only the short GRB, originate from binary system. And these binary systems are composed of different combinations of CO star, neutron star, white dwarf, black holes, and new neutron star, each composition forming a binary system. And only in some of the subclass uh, are present the black hole. Therefore, this is one fundamental point that long GRBs only in a few, in a small subclass, which we will show shortly, the, the black hole is formed. And they are in particular out of this binary starting from a CO core and a companion binary neutron star, um, there are particularly three different classes which different uh, um, episodes, but all of them, all these episodes are mildly relativistic. And the velocity, the Lorentz gamma factor, constrained by model independent li limits on their macroscopic Lorentz gamma factor. Therefore, only a fewer black holes, the majority are long GRBs on a larger family. And the last definition of this family has been recently presented. There are 380 BDHN, which start from a CO star, a neutron star, and form a black hole. They are X-ray flash, they are um, other system, and they are also the short GRB uh, as a different uh, component of the GRB classification. But let's see the dynamic of a BDHN. is represented in this uh, diagram in which, uh, in which you have uh, a binary system very massive, uh, 1520 solar mass on the left, which first evolve uh, forming a neutron star. And here you have on the left uh, a case like Senex 3. And after the Senex 3 evolve, here you have a common envelope. And then the CO star, which was, uh, 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 which is part of the, the second component of the Senex 3, which we showed before, undergoes a supernova. And then you have this tremendous accretion of the supernova into the neutron star. And this process is the one which generates the gamma ray burst with energy of 10 to the 54 ergs. Here you have some beautiful um, uh, simulation, which we did 
in uh, Ecranet in collaboration with the Los Alamos Laboratory. Here you have the place where the supernova exploded. I will show you a few examples now. And the accretion on the companion neutron star here. And uh, this accretion is the one which, uh, if the binary system is close enough, is the one which creates a black hole. And out of this, you have the accretion of the supernova into um, the remnant of the supernova, like, like the one in the crab, in which you have the supernova and the creation of a neutron star. Also, this supernova created a, a new neutron star in the moment the supernova occurs. And this, of course, is in addition to the companion neutron star, which is in the binary. Therefore, the accretion of the supernova into the new neutron star, we follow this and we will show you shortly, because this is the accretion which leads to the, um, the X-ray emission of the afterglow. On the other side, we, we have the accretion of the neutron star on the, on the black hole, and this uh, process, extracting the energy from the inner energy of the black hole, is the one by quantum electrodynamical process, a synchrotron emission, which generate the JEV emission observed in gamma ray burst. Therefore, we have out of the key role of the supernova exploding and accreting in the new neutron star the two different phenomena of the afterglow and uh, which follow a very specific power law and the accretion on the, on the, new, on the black hole which generate the GEV radi radiation. And of course, after this, later here, you have the optical supernova emission after 28 days. These are two examples, again, thanks to the collaboration of um, uh, Wang Yu and, uh, and uh, uh, Rueda and uh, the other people uh, at Los Alamos. Uh, uh, the case of two uh, objects, a, a supernova, which uh, a period um, uh, very short, and uh, uh, here at 120 seconds, and the BDHM2, which a period much longer of 406 seconds. In this case, the closeness, the uh, fact that the binary is very con con uh, compact it can form a black hole. In this other case, you don't form a black hole, but just a massive neutron star. These are beautiful examples. The characteristic of this system is that they are practically very different if they are seen from the top. The, the fact that they are in a binary system, the view in the plane of the orbit of the binary or normal to the plane of the binary is very different and is here represented. What can we learn on this general thing about 1901-40XC? Well, the instrument which have made this observation so unique possible are many. The Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope has been the one of the four major interpreter. The VLT in, um, in Chile have been essential in determining the redshift and all the details uh, of this emission. But clearly, one of the greatest success has been the SWIFT NASA telescope with the calorimeter developed also with the collaboration of ENFN, which has allowed to look, to look not only at the MEV, 
but uh, also at the GEV radiation with incredible uh, efficiency. And, uh, and uh, for a GRB 19114C, there has been also something very exceptional. The first time that we see not only uh, X-ray by SWIFT, not only X-ray and MEV by SWIFT, not only MEV and JEV by Fermi, but also TEV by a magic telescope. And all this has been done in connection with uh, the newly born uh, Hard X-ray Modulation Telescope of the Chinese uh, Academy of Science guided by Nanzang. But in addition of that, what made possible the observation of the supernova and all the data of GRB 1914C has not been less than 52 optical observatory from the ground. Of this object, just a few hours that was detected, we announced that they was, there was, this was a BDHN one. We could say that from the redshift to the energy. And we predicted that after 23, 24 days, the supernova will appear in that location in which 1901-14C was observed. And indeed, this was the case. But let's go a moment to new result, which I want to present. The binary driven hypernova, when they are looked from the top, uh, you can see that the key quantity to be observed is the supernova. And uh, this is uh, a beautiful picture of our simulation of the supernova after a fraction of second in our simulation. And, uh, and here we go with uh, the first big result that thanks to the fact that these four GRB are seen from the top, not uh, in the plane of the orbit, we have detected for the first time in four of them the supernova emission. This is the spectrum. These are the energy. And what is, uh, I cannot go into detail, but um, uh, the, 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 the key point is that these supernova uh, are much more energetic than a normal supernova. And their energy is of the order of 2.8, 0.6, 1.4, 1.09 of 10 to the 52 works. There is a fantastic uh, uh, physics to develop uh, about this object, which are necessarily very different from a normal supernova, because the CO core rotating very, very closely um, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to the neutron star uh, companion is uh, practically the putting co-rotation and the new astrophysics of the supernova comes out. But let's go now to the second discovery, the afterglow. The afterglow, first of all, all 380 BVHN, all 380 BVHN are characterized by redshift, by, uh, by um, uh, of, by, by the energetic being larger than 10 to the 52 org due to the formation of the black hole. But most important, everyone has also an afterglow, all of them. And this afterglow has a luminosity which decrease in time 
with a characteristic index alpha x, which is minus 1.48 plus or minus of 32. And here you can see the, fur, the four afterglow of our fantastic four GRB, which we selected in this talk. You see the slope, but what is very important is that we understood that this radiation in all of them, this is the case um, of uh, 16 or 625b, and the corresponding published in RPJ, and this is the corresponding uh, of 1304.27a. But the beauty is that we can, in order of time, 604 after 600 seconds from the GRB trigger, 1,100 seconds, we can follow the X-ray luminosity and, uh, and as a function of time. And the, the fitting is perfectly with uh, a, a synchrotron spectrum, but the synchrotron spectrum not with very high gamma. A synchrotron spectrum which is generated by the interaction of the rotating neutron star with the accretion material of the supernova. These are the great examples that we have done. And from the, therefore, for in all these cases, we uh, know the mass of the companion neutron star, of the new neutron star, to be um, of the order of 1.4 solar masses. And then we can determine the initial spin of the new neutron star accreting from. Uh, the supernova material at very la low gamma, with gamma which is uh, necessarily smaller than uh, two. And uh, therefore, the origin of the energy is not a relativistic blast wave, but is the energy of rotation of the new neutron star, which was created by the supernova in the supernova event. Well, this is the second result. The third result, which I, I am presenting here, is has to do with 1901-14c, which is unique in that sense, because uh, uh, it emits not only in the JEV, but also in the TEV. And also in this uh, case, all the, the the um, all the all the JEV emission follow a power law with the, the luminosity when measured in the rest frame of the source. The luminosity in JEV follow a law which is T minus one point nine zero zero four. Therefore, what is the situation? We have a power law for the X-ray after, after glow, and that helps us in determining the mass and the spin of the new neutron star generating the afterglow. But here, in the case of 1901-14c, we are after a much more important result, first time we are uh, proving that this energy, which uh, uh, explain that power law, originates from the rotational energy of the Kerr black hole. But let's go by step. I said that we have 380 VADHN, all of them with an afterglow. Of this 380, in view of the limited angle of detection of, LAT, of the LAT observatory, not all 380 
emit the jet radiation. And also due to the fact that like to see the supernova rise, we have to be normal to the plane of the orbit. Also in this condition, we have to be normal to the plane of the orbit. And there are only 25 of this BDHN which emit jet radiation. But the beauty in these 25 cases is the fact that we have uh, uh, shown that the black hole rotational energy can explain the jet energy and uh, fulfilling the transparency condition one of the most important results we have obtained is in this paper in APJ 2019 in which uh, the, the synchrotron time scale of the jet radiation has been established and the fact that using the mass formula of uh, our uh, 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 determined with uh, Stephen and with, uh, 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 with uh, Christodoulou, uh, we can explain the extractable energy of the black hole and infer the mass and the spin of the, of the black hole. And in this paper in APJ, we report the value of the A over M, the spin initial, the mass of the black hole, and also the mass of irreducible mass. Therefore, we are really in a new era. For the first time, we are able, in these sources, in three of them, to measure the mass of the black hole and, uh, and uh, the spin of the black hole, alpha, A over M, and also determine the condition for transparency and uh, the value of the magnetic field, B0. And therefore, this is the third main result, not only to see the interpreter number one, the supernova rise, not only to see the accretion of the supernova on the new neutron star created in the afterglow, but also to understand that the energy source comes out from the mass and the rotation spin of the black hole. How can we describe this? We describe this thanks to a very, very beautiful work which was done at Princeton by one of the students in the group of, uh, uh, in our group with John Wheeler. And of course, they were outstanding students at the time. Jacob Beckenstein was fantastic. And uh, in uh, UNRU was also there, was the first to show that indeed you could induce charges on, uh, on a black hole. And, uh, and, uh, and there were many other, of course, uh, we were also surrounded by other former graduate students by Anso Anya and many, and many uh, other outstanding. But the work of Wald was uh, particularly important. It was uh, subjected to a lot of discussion, a lot of, um, and has been bit by bit, without even myself understanding at the time, but only later, that this was the most important, one of the most important results obtained in those years in Princeton. Uh, the solution that he was able to obtain based on the uh, previous work of Achille Papapetro, who was visiting us in those years at Princeton from his uh, original university in Paris. This, uh, this uh, solution uh, by Wald and Papa Petru is the basis for understanding 
the rotational energy abstraction of a black hole. And uh, to understand the fact that uh, thanks to the fact that there is uh, not an isolated black hole, that what is the novelty? The fundamental novelty is that we could not extract rotational energy of the black hole because we are always assume the configuration of the black hole to be time independent, um, asymptotically flat, and stationary, and in vacuum. This solution is different. This solution is non-stationary. It's time varying. The second is not asymptotically flat, but as a magnetic field aligned with the rotation axis of the black hole. And uh, it's not stationary. It is aligned with the magnetic field and as an electrodynamic. Though the total charge of the system is zero, the acceleration process as such that we can extract the rotational energy of the black hole. Well, this has been also, in doing this, we have also introduced a new quantity. The black hole, when radiates, is not radiating continuously but is emitting in uh, like a machine gun, in quanta, in quanta of energy, which we have defined with Weda in uh, a recent paper. The quantum of uh, energy is by far one of the deepest new result in the understanding of uh, the energy extraction of the black hole. The formula is beautiful. Energy H bar times not new, but an effective new, which is related to the magnetic field B0, to the A over M of the black hole, to the Planck mass divided by mass of the neutron. And the same goes with the energy. The energy radiated is uh, this. Well, this, uh, I, we, we, we were so incredibly happy when we understood this conceptual uh, breakthrough. And we looked immediately for value. What is this black hole quantum looks like? In a GRB, for example, 13 or 427, but the same similar for 19 or 114C, the GRB uh, emit uh, on a time scale of 10 minus 5 seconds. The energy of the electron accelerated goes up to 10 to the 18 AV, and therefore generating also ultra relativistic cosmic ray. And the total energy of the, of the blob is of the order of the quantum is 10 to the 36 erg. And the radiation in uh, Jev is of the order as observed in 10 to the 41 erg per second. But the beauty is that this equation of the black holic energy is valid not only in the active galactic uh, in the GRB, but can be applied as well to the active galactic nuclei. Zero for the, uh, in that case, the characteristic emission time is not of the order of uh, 100 millisec uh, of uh, uh, 10 minus 5 second, but is of the order of 0.49 day, of the order of day. Again, the energy is a little larger, but the energy radiated is much bigger than in the case of uh, that in the case of GRB, up to 10 to the 47 Hertz. And the luminosity is of the order of 10 to the 43 Hertz per second. This uh, is the picture 
that uh, we have in mind. There is no bulk expansion motion. The radiation is just emitted close to the black hole radius. The electro electron radiated in the GEV. The GEV energetic is paid by the extractable energy. The high energy emission is produced by synchrotron radiation. The system transparent to, is transparent to the GEV radiation. The GEV emission is um, radiated in, uh, in uh, um, what is very important, not homogeneous, but within a 60 degree angle from the black hole rotation. We finally have the dream of having this jet of the order of 60 degree um, seen on, uh, uh, with the corresponding constitutive equation and the energy emission from the black hole. But uh, can we see, can we see a black hole quantum? These are the beautiful uh, data uh, uh, this, uh, observed by the very large uh, um, radio observatory in Socorro, New Mexico. How much time do you need still? Uh, little, I am concluding. Okay, perfect. Uh, the day, these are the day, you see, the, the characteristic blobs here one, here another one, are emitted precisely of the order of a few days apart. Let's see another beautiful picture, again taken by Socorro. We see the blobs here, here, here. And again, the characteristic emission time is of the order of day. Our opinion is that already in this system, in these blobs, we see precisely the amount of energy, of a black hole energy emitted. Of course, uh, this is enormously important because in these cases, the mass of the black hole being of the order of 10 to the 10 solar masses scale all the quantity, which in the case of G GRV, are 10 minus 5 seconds. But the physics is precisely the same. Therefore, we are really understanding, viewing, thanks to radio astronomy, which we can go look in the center, we can see the moment of emission of the black hole energy. And in the case of GRB, we can see from the luminosity as a function of time, that indeed this uh, sequence uh, of black hole quantum give origin to the power law of the uh, to the power law of um, uh, the jet emission. We have 380 BDHN1 characterized by a cosmological redshift and ISO 10 to the 52 and an afterglow. From the luminosity of the afterglow, we can determine the, in the BDHN theory, the initial mass and spin of the mu neutron star. Of these 380 BDHN, <coughs> in view of the special conical morphology and the foresight angle of Fermilat, only 25 are observed in, in, in emission. But again, they follow a special power law. From this observation of the power law, we can observe for the first time the mass and the spin of each gem emitting GRB. It was John Wheeler who first thought to use the Planck mass in bosons and Fermi star. I asked him, who introduced this net? Oh, he said, as usual, look for some old article. <laughs> He was modest, but he wanted to keep like that. Let us stay like that. But Johnny profound help, inspiration and visions in Princeton have influenced a generation of student, collaborator and astrophysicist worldwide. 
There has been a large number of undergraduate and PhD postdoctoral faculty who have contributed these three major discoveries I mentioned today. And of course, we are grateful to all of them, and we are grateful especially to Albert Einstein to have given us the equation, the thought, the inspiration to be able to, thanks to his idea, to open the eyes of a very powerful, energetic, and uh, universe. And we have some reason to believe that all this is also leading to the possibility that the GRB and active galactic nuclei are using, but I will not discuss today, this energy and this enormous energy with the magnetized electrodynamical field to the birth of the DNA in a universe which will be only otherwise not bringing the observer and the life existing. So, Finish. Okay. Mm -hmm. so Cesar, can you read the questions, please? Yes, I can do that. Just in a few seconds. Uh, first of all, we have a, a, a comment uh, by Felix Berabel. Nice talk, Hamel. Did you hear? Thanks, yes. Okay, then there Thanks. is another... Speak tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And thanks yes. to you and Cesar and Peter to organize this splendid activity in this very special moment. We, we, you give us a fantastic way to keep science going and communication going. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Hamo. Also, I, I, I can speak on behalf of, of, of Peter Hayes, of course. And uh, there is another question. Now it's a question, not a, a comment. Uh, again, by Felix Mirabel. What about the super relativistic jets in long gamma ray bursts? Are jets produced in black hole formed by direct collapse? Did you understand me? Yes. I think we lost him. I think we lost him. Um, Hemo, are you there? No, he's out. We lost him. Yes. No microphone. He's not anymore in the participant list. Okay. Something happened with his uh, computer. So we have some questions for him. So we'll send to him, yes? That's okay? Yeah. Okay. Oh, he's back? No, oh, no, he's not. One so, second. You, the professor is coming back. One second, please. We, we had some... Some problems with the connection. Here it is. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Question. <laughs> so, repeat the question, Cesar. Yes, of course. Hemo, there yes. is a, a question from Felix Mirabel. Yes. He's asking about super relativistic jets in long gamma ray, and, uh, uh, long gamma ray bursts. And he asks us if the jets are produced in black hole format by direct collapse. Okay, the, the thing, this is a very important question asked from Felix. Because now we can, we can measure the mass of the black hole from our theory. And this of the order of four, five, up to eight solar masses, nine solar masses. But this black hole is always in all this system. We can see the moment is formed. 
and is formed not by direct collapse, but is formed by accretion on an already existing neutron star. And this, trans this accretion is smooth, totally smooth. And now the very, very interesting question, which we are working on, is that it could be very well that in some special condition in which the neutron star is so close to the CO core that the, that the neutron star goes inside the CO core and it uh, explodes uh, and it explodes uh, without um, without having uh, this uh, accretion phase. This could be something related to the idea of uh, uh, missed uh, supernova. But I think the field is just fantastic. The key point, black holes are formed smoothly. And especially important, the radiation, the enormous energy radiation is not at distance of 10 to the 16 or 10 to the 17 centimeter from the horizon. It originates from the world Papa Petru solution very, very close to the horizon. But it's not, it's not, an, <laughs> it's not an horizon. The, it's not an horizon to, to use what used to be an horizon. But the, if you look at the black hole, in other words, uh, like M87, you don't see the rise. You see only this enormous energy coming out like the, they have shown in the Socorro data. Therefore, novelty completely. The energy does, the, the black hole formation is smooth by accretion on a neutron star. Two. The radiation does not come from very far. It originates directly on the black hole due to the, to, due, due to the interaction uh, with the magnetic field with zero 10 to the 10 Gauss. And the last, uh, the, the, the last uh, point de refor is that uh, uh, the energy comes out, but is not a, a stationary black hole. In other words, to have a, an horizon, you have stationarity. And everything you, we see here, both in these cases, and of course, tomorrow, I will look forward to the, to the, uh, the presentation of Felix, all in his microquasar, we see exactly a non-stationary solution. And therefore, not the old idea of the black hole of Oppenheimer uh, as neither, but the new physics of an alive black hole extracting enormous amount of energy from, uh, from the Kerr solution. Thanks to the electrodynamic of, uh, um, uh, um, of, the, uh, of the solution of, um, uh, I, 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 I just showed. Uh, maybe one last question before we continue. Yes. Okay, um, I have one question for, from Vladimir Kares. From? Uh, his, he asks the following. In calculations, we find that a moderate inclination between the black hole rotation axis and the large scale magnetic field help to increase the terminal velocity of accelerated particles in the outflow. What is your opinion about no asymmetric configurations? Well, um, first at all, uh, is not, I, I, I fully agree, and this is the paper in APJ uh, last year in which we present the, the, world, uh, 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 the, uh, the world solution as uh, generating the inner engine, uh, the inner engine of the, 
uh, can I go back to the presentation? The inner engine, uh, if I can go back. Uh, in any way, uh, the, the presence, no, we cannot. Anyway, you will go back and you see the last picture I have shown. Of course, uh, you cannot, if you don't have a magnetic field outside, uh, you cannot have uh, extraction of energy and you cannot, and, uh, you cannot have uh, time varying uh, 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 and not enforce the, station, the, the stationarity. Therefore, I fully agree with you, but the magnetic field is much uh, more complicated. Uh, you have to look back to this uh, fantastic picture which I have shown about the um, Papa Petru wall solution where you see the lines of force going in and going out. By the way, uh, th this machine works both for electron and proton. Uh, the only difference if, if the electric field, the spin of the black hole is aligned with the magnetic field or counter aligned. And of course it's symmetric as the two blobs on both sides. Oh, now it's only question to make more uh, detail uh, uh, that analysis, but the machine is absolutely there. And of course, I agree that the role of the magnetic field and of a very, very special geometry, which you can see from that uh, figure of, uh, but we can compute. We have all the equations. And this has been made possible thanks to uh, uh, more than 20 years of work since we work with Jim Wilson on the acceleration of electron positron around black hole and with Thibaut Damour, the first example of how to use the Kerr-Newman solution for generating um, the GRB, which was done just a, a few months after the discovery of gamma ray burst, but was too early and was too vague, uh, though beautiful, to be confronted with the data. The data were not available. They became to arrive after after 26 years of our paper with Thibault. But well, uh, it's already there. Excuse me, I have to stop now. Uh, very, uh, much, very much thank you for the very nice talk you gave. And uh, I have to talk now to Cesar Sen because the Thank you for both of you. You have done a fantastic job and, uh, a, a, and really congratulations. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> I have we checked the us participant us list. We see and, us in uh, you have to put on as co host uh, Radzinski, Radzinski, Popov, and Scotchola. Okay, look at them and uh, put them to the co-host list. Uh, Uyan, Gao, and you, I didn't find. If they hear me, they can maybe uh, say they are there. Yes, I am there, Irina Radinsky. Yeah, yeah, uh, Rancinci, but I'm looking for you, Gao, and Uyan. Yeah. No, they are not there. Irina is already uh, co-host, okay? Popov. Sergei? Yes, Sergei? I'm here. Okay, Sergei also. We have to put a course. Uh, uh, I didn't okay. see him as Not a course. Bad. And yes. then... Not bad also. Okay, Irina, Norbert. So we can Sergei start. Already. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, Francisco also. Just one second. I need to take a look. Just a sec. Okay. So we have to make uh, Francisco. So we have Francisco Siddhartha also. I'm looking for Francisco. I'm here. Yes. Uh, uh, you are our, our red co host? Yes? Yes, I am. Yes, I can. I can share. I can share with you and all that. Fantastic. Irina is also. Norberto also. Eugene also. Yeah. 
Yes. Yes, I'm um, Francisco. Sergey. Sergey, you also are our co host already. Please try. Hello. So, we start, no? Yes, he's a uh, co host also. Who is, uh, uh, well, I don't find, I don't find uh, Buyan. And Buyan is there. Yeah. yeah. Buyan is there? Yeah. Oh, is there? Okay. Perfect. Let me see. Where is? You. Yeah. I, don't see. Yeah. I don't find him. He knows. So, sir, you have a problem with your microphone. Oh, yes? Yeah, okay. uh, there's a sound. Each time that you talk, there is a sound. There is noise. Noise? Yes, I'm not. Oh, maybe because we are two persons here. Story, so, one is make some... Yeah, okay, I will probably do that. Maybe it's too... too... Yeah, too high. Okay. Is better now? No. <laughs> Okay, uh, since there are some problems with my microphone, it's too, it's, too, it's too noisy, I will pass the hosting to Peter, okay, Peter? Okay, thanks. Have... And uh, yeah? will you start the presentation or how we do it now? I, I think you, I should start, yes, of course. Okay. So I will share a screen, okay, and we will start the presentation. And then you, you can follow, okay, with everybody. How many times do you have? 10 minutes? Well, it's okay. Uh, I think we, we have time. Okay. No problem. Okay, this is the presentation, okay? Okay. So I just will so I'm sharing my screen and this is the presentation. So we start with uh, Eugene Oaks and we can so should I comment on this presentation? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, this is about some significant modifications in the stark broadening of hydrogen lines caused by very strong magnetic field, which is characteristic for white dwarfs is well known. Magnetic field could be as high as 100 Tesla or 100,000 Tesla. In the 
conventional theory of the stark broadening of hydrogen lines, the perturbing electrons are considered moving along straight lines. Of course, everybody knows that in strong magnetic field, plasma electrons actually follow helical path. And in this presentation, not in this presentation, in this work, it was shown that after we take this into account, and by the way, analytically, and then confirmed by numerical calculations, the result is very dramatic change. Let me just announce the final result because I don't think I should go into details of stark broadening theory here. So it showed that uh, for standard Balmer lines used for diagnostics of electron density in white dwarfs, Balmer alpha line, Balmer beta lines, if you use them without taking into account strong magnetic field that changes dramatically trajectory of plasma electrons, then you would underestimate the electron density deduced from the width of these lines by up to one order of magnitude, underestimate. Now, the situation is different for higher lines like Balmer delta and higher lines. If you use those lines, you would overestimate without taking into account the effect of helical trajectories of electrons. You would overestimate the electron density deduced from those lines by several times. Interestingly enough, the Balmer gamma line is the least affected. So one of the consequences of these results is for the future, it's first of all, probably it's a good idea to look back to all previous interpretations of experimental Balmer lines from white dwarfs and the electron density deduced from them. And second, for the future, the best is to use Balmer gamma line, which is least affected by the effect of strong magnetic field and helical trajectories of perturbing electrons. So this is in a nutshell what this work is about. Okay, at the end of the, all the session, we will make the, uh, we will have the questions. Now the next speaker is, uh, um, Jan is not there. So it is so a cow there, so it's Irina. No, it's Sitata, okay. So Francisco, can you start please? Yes, so should I describe uh, yeah. the context uh, of the talk? Yes, please. Okay, so uh, it's kind of weird. My talk is in this session, but I'm, uh, it's about uh, dark matter. So what we do is to just extend uh, currently interesting uh, dark matter model named uh, Fossey dark matter. Uh, which uh, obeys the dynamics of uh, Bose condensate. So one condition for this dark matter to be correct is that it has to be ultralight. So uh, structure formation uh, calculations indicate that its mass should be of the order of 10 to the minus 21 or 10 to the minus 23 electron volts in order to be consistent with uh, the abundance of uh, small structures. So the problem we are trying to tackle now is the uh, explanation of VPOs, which is the motion of satellite galaxies around major galaxies, which uh, shows uh, to be anisotropic. In fact, uh, satellites seem to travel through planes that pass near the galactic poles, which is rather unexplainable. So what we do is to propose a solution to the dynamics equations for the boson condensate namely the schrodinger poisson system of equations, and find multi-state solutions. So very similar to those uh, solutions of electrons around the hydrogen atom. And then we uh, try uh, using a probabilistic approach to explain the most likely positions of test particles around major galaxies. So what we find is that these multi-state uh, configurations can actually provide an explanation which is still under on their study. The, the, the last uh, figures show this, the distribution of particles. But a major problem in a dark matter model is uh, 
to show that these structures are stable and actually can be formed. So this uh, talk is about stability and formation of these structures. I don't know if I have to say more. Uh, thank you very much. So we will now uh, pass to the next one, but uh, just a comment uh, that everybody uh, resumes his talk three to five minutes. Can, can I, can up I to ask now very well. uh, uh, Gutsman uh, to, to send, to contact me because I'm very interested in that work? Certainly, yes. So the next uh, speaker is uh, Radinci. Yes, and hello everybody. Uh, in our talk, we present the results obtained for the Einstein and Müller energy in the case of a new uh, asymptotically Reisner Nordstrom black hole solution. Uh, this black hole solution is obtained uh, from the coupling of the gravitational field uh, and uh, nonlinear electrodynamics. We use the Einstein and Müller uh, energy momentum complexes for the calculation. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, the metric function uh, depends on the mass of the black hole and the uh, electric charge. We have uh, here uh, the small leaf, which is the uh, metric function. And the Einstein energy has a bit simple uh, expression. And the Muller energy, a bit complicated one. Both the expression uh, depends on the mass and the electric charge of the black hole. Next slide, please. And here we have the graphical representations. On the left side, we have uh, the plots of the energy, Einstein in green and uh, Muller in red, for enough large uh, distances. And uh, on the right side, we have uh, the same energies uh, nearby uh, origin. From uh, this representation, we see that uh, Einstein energy is everywhere positive, and the Muller energy presents a small region of negativity, which is not so good. Also, all the momenta vanish in uh, both prescriptions. Energy has uh, well-defined uh, expressions, uh, depending on the mass of the black hole and the uh, electric charge. Um, we have uh, some uh, conclusion about the positive regions of the both energy in Einstein and Muller prescriptions, and also about the small uh, negativity region of the Muller prescription. Uh, for the um, positive region, we uh, conclude that uh, this region can uh, be uh, allowed us to study the gravitational field like uh, convergent lens and the uh, a uh, small negativity region of the Muller energy can be can be used like a divergent lens. Also, in the table, we have some limiting and particular cases. Nearby origin, uh, both energies are equal to zero. Also, for large distances, uh, both energies uh, tend to the mass of the black hole, which is the arm of its lesser mass. And also for uh, the case when uh, the charge vanishes, we have also uh, these results, the energies, both energies, Einstein and Muller, uh, are equal to the mass of the uh, black hole. And thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> the next speaker is uh, uh, Jesus. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank for the organizing committee for letting me present uh, my work in this spotlight uh, session. Today I want to talk about this uh, model that uh, I've developed along with uh, Professor Dimitrios Janios during my postdoctoral stay at Purdue University. Uh, this model um, relies on the idea that all jets, all laser jets are launched with similar energy per baryon. Uh, but they are independent of the of their power. I mean, the, the energy provided is independent of uh, of the power of the jet. Um, 
this translates in, in, in the blazers, this translates into the fact that FSRQs uh, managed to accelerate to high bulk clearance factors and uh, the emission from these effects um, corresponds to mildly or low magnetized jets. On the other side, we have the BLAC objects um, are not so powerful, but they do show uh, high magnetic fields. Next, please. So this is motivated from observations uh, where um, BLX and FSRQs uh, show different um, apparent speeds in radio observations. And in the gamma rays, FSRQs show a soft spectrum while BLX show a hard spectrum in the, um, in the gamma rays. Um, and uh, so this um, brought the, the question if there is a blazer sequence uh, proposed in 1998 by Fossati et al. Um, so in our model, we take the variant loading uh, given by that, that expression mu as a function of the bulk clearance factor of the jet and the magnetization of the jet sigma. And we uh, propose um, an, uh, that the luminosity of the jet or actually the, um, the accretion ratio is uh, a function of the bulk clearance factor. So in our results, in our simulations, what we got, it's uh, what we can see in the last, uh, in the last slide. So in the, on, the, on the left, we compare the spectral index in the gamma rays as a function of the luminosity and put uh, our simulations uh, along with observations from Fermi and uh, we get a very good um, recovery of this uh, observational of this um, uh, observational properties. Uh, we did the same with the with the luminosity of the broad line region, with the apparent velocity and the Compton dominance, the apparent velocity taken from radio, and the Compton dominance defined as the ratio between the the. Uh, high energy bump of the SEDs of blazers and uh, over the, the synchrotron component. And we get um, that our simulations uh, recover observations and that we can see, for instance, on the right hand side of the plots on the uh, right hand side, we can see the trend of increasing luminosity. Uh, so we find, um, we also see on the, on the lower left, um, the, uh, the, that we recover these um, uh, blazer sequence that Fossati et al. in 1998 uh, obtained from, from observations. And uh, finally, on the last plot, we can see this uh, mu, mu sigma gamma uh, uh, relation showing how the, the luminosity gives us the uh, the the oh, the blazer sequence just in a small range of baryon loading. Thank you. So well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to remind you that please post your questions in the question and answer box. We haven't had received yet any question, so please do so. Uh, the, one question. Yeah, and, and next one, uh, and the end of the talk, of the, all the talks. Uh, please write in the question and answer box. Now there is, uh, Buyan has arrived, so he will be the next uh, speaker. I don't know if he's co-host. Cesar, can you check? Uh, yes, I can check. Yes, of course, I can do that. Well, at yeah. least I see the, his talk, but I don't see him in the participant. Yes. I don't see also. Go to the next speaker, please. Yes, okay. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Scott Kola. Please start your presentation. Yes, uh, hello. In this presentation, we have studied the properties of the hadrons 
under the presence of strong magnetic fields. Basically, we use a number general senior model, and we were particularly interested in the behavior of the pion and nucleon masses. Uh, we made a calculation, as I said, using the number general senior model, and we compare with the existing and also the result from current perturbation theory. If you go to the next slide, please. Next slide, okay. The motivation to, to study this is that uh, it is is of the order of 10 to the 19 Gauss, which is around 0.1 V square, or even larger might exist in the interior part of the magnetars or during the early stages of relativistic heavy ion collisions. So for this reason, it is interesting to see how the hadron properties are modified. To perform the calculation, we use the Landau gauge. We calculate the polarization functions of the charged particle uh, using the Ritus eigenfunction method that takes fully into account the presence of the Schwinger phases. Uh, for the nucleons, we consider the phi equation that accounts for the quark exchange interaction between the die quarks and the quark components. Please go to the next one. Cesar, please go to the next Cesar. Okay, so these are the main results of uh, our work. Uh, we observed that the, the mass of the pi zero stays basically constant with the magnetic field, while that of the charge pions increased rather strongly with the magnetic field, even above uh, the result that one would expect from a point pair point by our uh, point like pion. So taking into account the structure of the pion gives a stronger rise. Well, for the proton and the neutron, we observe in both cases a decrease of the mass at the beginning. So up to magnetic fields of the order of 0.5 GB square, uh, the, um, the mass is of the proton and neutron decreases. And then about that value of the magnetic field, they start to increase. Our results are reasonable, consistent with the lattice keys in the result. Uh, and that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, the next one is uh, given by Sergei Popov. Can you please start? Hello, everybody. Um, I thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to give this presentation. So I'll briefly present our new results. They just appeared in the archive at the very end of August on magnetic field decay neutron stars. So there is a long-standing problem. Um, if magnetic field in normal radio pulsars decay, and there are different views on this problem, luckily observers continuously um, give us more and more data. And recently this year appeared a paper um, by the authors um, whose name you see on the screen in which they made a very precise timing of a large set of normal standard classical radio pulsars. And for several of them, they measured breaking indices. So this uh, number demonstrates how rapidly the um, spin evolution is going on. And for many of these sources, they obtained that they have breaking indices larger than 10, so a few tens. It corresponds, you see it on the plot on the right, uh, to uh, movement to the right and downward in the P classical PP dot diagram. So uh, we think that this can be an important result because such behavior points to magnetic field decay. And we quantitatively um, study this effect uh, in the model of uh, neutron star evolution. So please show the next slide. Uh, so uh, what we include in the model is thermal evolution of neutron stars, magnetic field evolution and spin down evolution. And uh, in the plot, uh, you see uh, breaking indices on the vertical axis 
and the characteristic age on the horizontal axis. Red uh, symbols with error bars correspond to the data points from the paper you saw above, and lines correspond to models uh, for neutron stars of different masses. Masses are indicated in the legend of the figure. And uh, we obtained that in the classical approach to thermal and magnetic field evolution of neutron stars, we can explain the data if uh, these neutron stars with large breaking indices have small masses, which means that they cool down very slowly. So they stay hot for quite a long time. And one type of magnetic field decay related to phonons in the crust of a neutron star is effective for a long time. Uh, long time here means like few um, hundreds of kilo years. And this nicely explains the, this new data. And it's in good correspondence with previous results, which we studied in our papers a few years ago. Uh, so we think that we have a new indication of an episode of uh, magnetic field decay in classical radio pulsars. And this um, field decay is uh, closely linked to thermal evolution of neutron stars. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cesar Uyan Diego, can you please make him co-host? Yes, I'm looking for him just to, to do that, but I cannot find him. He's in the participant list. Ah, yeah, he his name's M-R-U-T. Uh, okay, okay. Okay. So you can hear me, right? Yes. Yes. You can hear you. I have to make you co-host. Just, uh, I'm just looking for your name to do that. It's uh, above Benno Bodman. Just above. Yeah, help me. Rutunyaya Buyan. Maybe you can give me a help to find his name. His name. I'm looking and I, I don't find. Is the participant here? Yes, I'm doing that. Yes, uh, it seems that Benno Bodman, Gabriele Piccinelli. Yeah, I see it right above Benno's name. Hello, Stephen. Uh, okay, that's all right. So, thanks to the organizer and, uh, to present my work here in the ERA meeting that uh, symmetric energy and neutron pressure of finite nuclei using relativistic mean field for monitoring. Basically, in this work, we have uh, uh, studied the things that is the interlink between the nuclear matter and the uh, finite nuclei. And most importantly, here we study like uh, how to connect uh, the symmetric energy of finite nuclei and also infinite nuclear matter. Basically, in this study, we have used like relativistic mean field and the local density approximation along with the CDFM coherent density function of method for the calculations of symmetric energy, neutron pressure and compressibility of a finite nuclei. So, as we uh, know, uh, these are the more crucial quantity in uh, determining or constraining the equation of state of nuclear matter and vice versa. So here we have the motivation corresponding to do the calculations, which is based on the uh, nuclear matter um, constant, like uh, saturation density or double of the saturation density and uh, binding energy per particle pressure density, energy density, symmetric energy, and its coefficient corresponding to the finite nuclei. So uh, here, the more important part we have to care, that is the transition, because when you are talking about the nuclear matter, which is in the momentum space, and when we are talking about the um, finite nuclei, it is in the coordinate space. So the transition from the new momentum space to coordinate space is one of the job here. So here, the, uh, here in the equations, we have shown how we transit from the symmetric energy at local density, which can be integrated over the weight function. And for each weight function, we, in each nucleus, we can calculate the weight function. The weight function can be determined how effectively your density corresponding to, the, to a spherical density or a fluton. 
so each relative change in the density will give you the information about the change in the symmetric energy as well as its coefficients like in neutron pressure and also compressibility all these things so here uh, the important factor what we have already in, uh, in my talks i have already uh, said in the videos but here i can say that in the uh, in the integration there is in, in the each large term of the integration is containing like it symmetric energy neutron pressure and compressibility as a function of x that means it is in the local coordinate so this transition can be performed by using the ldm or by cdfm so here uh, the first attempt is that we introduce the relativistic mean field and we follow the procedure of cdfm and lda to convert our symmetric energy of infinite nuclear matter to the local density then we calculate the symmetric energy and pressure density compressibility of the finite nuclei and more interestingly if you see the figure in the symmetric energy on the upper panel of the first figure and the lower panel is the pressure density at magic nuclei there is a peak will appear around 30 and 50 for the ferrium nickel zirconium all the nucleus that means it is so uh, the symmetric energy also one of the uh, observable which can also help to determine the magic nuclei basically if we are going to determine the magic nuclei from the single particle energy or binding energy per particle or separation energy like two neutron separation energy or separation energy but when we are going to the trip line this kind of observable do not play much role because the binding energy per particle of a nucleus which is corresponding near to the beta stable region are more higher as compared to the drift line so we cannot find the signature but in this case the symmetric energy is uh, totally independent of the which part of the or we are we are in the drift line or we are in the beta stable region or we are other other or reference part of the nuclear chart it's no matter but symmetric energy can also be due to the signature which can be I mean, tell you that where the ne next magic nuclei or island of inversion in the intermediate region. Here we have studied some of the region where we can find the island of inversion at n is equal to 50 and 40 for this nuclei. And we also tested some of the things for the isotonic sense. But as we are considering the uh, magic neutrons, so uh, in the isotonic sense there is no proper signature is coming out. so more interesting studies to can be done in very near future for this region so um, for the moment we have only uh, have the like the isotopic sense and we have that uh, all the observables for the finite nuclei have been studied and it will also help to constrain the nuclear matter parameter in term of symmetric energy and its coefficient thank you the organizer again to present my talk okay thank you very much uh, now we have uh, according to my list we have finished or is uh, somebody left No, no. Because the others are not there. I don't find him. I don't find him. I didn't yeah, find. Yes, uh, we have problems with the China connection. Yes, I, I see. Let I Let see. us go to the question answers. Yes. Uh, please, uh, uh, if anybody has a question to the talks, there's still the possibility to post them in the question and answer yeah. section. There are three uh, questions. Bill can read. There are two questions to my talk. This is Eugene Ox. Okay. Um Jesus, are you with the questions or I read the questions? Well, I'm I could I could read the questions and give the answers. Okay. Yeah. Just to okay. continue. Okay. So there are two questions from Manuel Malhera. Uh, one basically they're in a, interconnected. Uh Electron densities in white dwarfs uh, deduced uh, from width. Uh, sorry, yes. sorry, just Eugene. Sorry, uh, uh, someone has to read the questions. Ah, okay, fine. The rest of the people they cannot see the questions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you would read the questions. No, I read the questions. Okay. Let me let me read the questions because the sound of uh, Caesar's mic is a little bit difficult. Right. So the first question is. About the talk of Ogin Ok, electron density in the white dwarfs deduced from width of hydrogen spectral lines. What is the intensity of the electric field? It is an electric field originated only in induction uh, due to the magnetic field, uh, or due to the magnetic field. 
Okay, let me answer this. Uh, electric field in the plasma of white dwarfs are due to charged particles, electrons and ions of the plasma. And in the case of white dwarfs with typical density of electron density 10 to the 17th of electrons in cubic centimeter, those electric fields are of the order of several tens kilovolts per centimeter. Now, speaking of any external to the plasma electric field, static field electric cannot penetrate into the plasma. It got screened. The only field, electric field that can penetrate into plasma should be at the frequency higher than so-called plasma electron frequency, which is of the order of laser frequencies. So the electric field that produces stark broadening is not due to magnetic field, is an intrinsic internal electric field produced by charged particles inside plasma. Okay, then the second question is related to the first one. Or could have some charge in the surface of the white dwarf originated also an electric field out of the star, but maybe you already answered it. Well, I think I already answered that. Yeah. Then there is a question to Buyan. Now it's gone. I am here. So that yeah, is the but it's gone. The America. question I saw a question, it's gone just now in front of my eyes. Okay, this question is about to I, how to be affected to the Newton square equation of stress and thrust. So basically, the, here we are, uh, whatever we shown to you, that is about the symmetric energy and also its coefficient. So it is one of the key parameters to constrain the equation of stress for the infinite nuclear matter as well as for the Newton star. So when we have a proper con constraint on the symmetric energy and its coefficient are two, uh, two times of the saturation density, then it is also give you a proper equation of state for the Newton star. It is directly connected to that. And further, if you are um, talking about the thrust, if we take the medium dependence or momentum dependence of the uh, thrust equation of state, and ultimately it is also connected with the symmetric energy that is the isosceme asymmetry of the Newton and proton for the cross the first region as well as for the density. So uh, it, it is one, uh, it, 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 this, this is the, this is the uh, link to the Newton star and the crust. Okay, so I don't, don't see any more questions. So Cesar, should we call it done for this day? May, may I say something? Yes, please. I think, I think there is a bunch of questions in the answered questions. Yeah, the question answers. And now the, I see four, but uh, all of them were already uh, answered. Answered, perfect. Okay, just to point yeah. that out. If, if someone uh, wrote the, the answer, answer it, it, uh, it changes, changes to the answered question. question. And, and this happened to this question was disappeared. I didn't understand you. The, the, the sound is very bad. So the, re the reason, is, the reason uh, you saw this other question to disappear, it was that it just moved to the answered section of Q&As. Ah, okay. Answer at 14. Yeah. Uh, let me see. There you if can it has see been that. answered by the speaker. Yes, yeah, so let me see. I have to look at the, at the time. 11, 12, 45. There was this... Uh, this is from F.S. Guzman. What is the motivation involved in the following the fuzzy dark matter called uh, CDM model? Spherical dark matter uh, halo is quite consistent with cosmological simulations are performed to simulate the cosmological large scale structure formation. It doesn't tell to whom it's uh, directed. Then there is, an, so nobody knows. Then there's a question to Popov. What other physical mechanisms other than the thermal evolution may cause the time decay of the magnetic field of the object you discussed? Yes, uh, this is quite a good question. I wrote an answer, but I would like also to comment um, personally. Uh, so indeed, there are several mechanisms of magnetic field decay. And uh, one is uh, magnetic field de decay due to uh, resistivity in the crust because of impurities in the crystal of the crust. 
And uh, this mechanism is not temperature dependent. It works forever. And we think that it cannot be very significant because we don't see a really significant evolution of the magnetic field of radio pulsars on long time scale. So on the time scale of tens of million years. Um, but the mechanism based on scattering of electrons of phonons is strongly temperature dependent. And uh, this uh, mechanism of magnetic field decay can be active for some time, like tens of thousand years, maybe 100 kilo year or something of that order. And then it uh, vanishes because the crust is cooling down, phonons are not there anymore. And uh, so this source of um, resistivity disappears. Okay, are there any more questions? So I think we can uh, call it for the day. What do you say, Cesar? It's fine. I, I changed my computer. Okay, so we will see us tomorrow yeah. again. But this time, all the speakers should be in the waiting room from seven o'clock on Mexican okay. time. Okay, so I'm finishing. You avoid some I'm, problems we had today. I'm finishing the program for tomorrow. I will send it immediately to Stephen <coughs> because he needs the email addresses of the speakers. I, yes. will, I will set up everything later this afternoon. Okay, good. <laughs> so. Uh, let me see, I have here some name. Uh, Aurora wrote, I am also seeing the parallel presentation. Are they live? Yes. Well, uh, the, the resume. Uh, the summation of them, not with the video we sent, is tomorrow will be the same. The, tomorrow will have the same program. This I can answer. I can show you, if you want, the yeah. program for tomorrow. I did already a version of layout. Yes? Mm -hmm. I can show you. Just give me a few seconds and I do that. It's good because uh, help people to organize themselves, yeah? So, oh, this computer is not good. Okay, uh, then uh, uh, there are some messages in WhatsApp that I will answer later on, because it's a long list. So uh, with this, I will close the meeting for today. And let's see tomorrow. And I urge that all the, uh, the speakers for tomorrow, of the plenary talks and so on, that they will be tomorrow in the waiting room, okay? So see you. Can I close now, Cesar? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So see you tomorrow. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Uh, Cesar thank you. likes to present. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye. How are you doing, Cesar? I'm doing fine.
with with my with my uh, apple everything works always <laughs> i am this is the, the the program for tomorrow okay i'm just uh, making some corrections and i will send you in a few minutes okay okay with the emails of everybody okay oh no this is the the, the wrong program Oh no no, this is the wrong problem. Just uh, just again, just uh, no no, this is the wrong problem. So what? Okay. Ah, uh, this is the new one. Okay, now it's okay. This is the new program for tomorrow. Where is it? Okay, can you see? Yes. 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 Okay, this is the program for tomorrow. I will send you in a few minutes, okay? Okay, great. I, I think I can send you now because I have it done already. Yeah, because then I'll have that and I have um, Mariana's list and I can uh, get everything set up. Yeah, yeah, because you need to do the emails, yeah, of everybody for tomorrow. Yes. So they can receive uh, individual invitations, yeah? Yes. Okay, that's okay. Uh, Stephen, I, I have a question about... Uh, I can hear you, Benno. Okay, uh, can we uh, increase the number of allowed co-hosts? I think we are limited to, to 12 people only. Okay, what's your question again? Uh, um, augment the number of co-hosts because we can only um, allow 12 co-hosts. Oh, I had not I had not seen that before. I'll ask Jeremy if there's a way to do that. Okay. If not, we have but to if, if, it, the if it gets to be an issue, though, then we just uh, make uh, the speakers co-hosts when they need to be and and remove the co-host yes, yes, when they don't. Of course. This is what we did today, yeah. And that's probably best anyway, because then there's not people accidentally um, leaving their mics on or something like that. Uh, okay, okay. Okay, okay, so have the program and I will send you now, okay? Okay. I'll make a PDF uh, version and I will send, uh, in reality, what I will do is the following. I will send to you and to the others, uh, to the rest of the people. Then I, okay. uh, then everybody will have this, uh, this uh, program, okay? Just, uh, no, I think it's better if I send to you only and to Beno, and Beno can make a, a review, yes? In order to be sure that everything is fine. Mm -hmm. And then I send to the rest of the people. I have time to do that. Okay? Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll do the, okay. that's okay. I will do that now. I will send you mm -hmm. the program, okay? It is here. Send you by email, okay? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, it was was very good today, yeah. Oh, I think so too. Yes. Yeah. Small mistakes, but this is is nothing. It's, it's our this first day. We're just learning, and it's going to get uh, yeah. smoother and smoother. Yeah, we are learning. Yeah. The, the best thing is learning by doing. Isn't yeah. It? Sure. <laughs> Is <laughs> this is the this is the 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 Elon Musk rule? You just <laughs> make mistakes. <laughs> you just make mistakes by doing. <laughs> How did um, things look on my slides with both English and Spanish? Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's okay. But it was only the last slide, I think. Or one of the last ones, I think. Yeah.
Yeah. In reality, we work too much and, and we are tired. And so it's, it's, uh, it, we easily can, can make mistakes, yeah? <laughs> okay. So I'm sending to you all the program for tomorrow. And, and then uh, as far as you, you give me the green light, I send to the others, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. I think tomorrow I will lose my apple because my apple is always fine. My Dell computer is always bringing some surprise. It's a good computer, but. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we can I think we can finish for today, yes. Yes, I'm just looking over what you sent and it's looking good as far as I've gotten looks so good. far. Looks good. Yes. I'm asking um I'm asking Ben to to make a review. Yeah, from <laughs> You know, Benno can really check some facts, but overall it looks very good to me. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I made a, a little bit different layout with the particip uh, concerning the participants of the, the discussion section. Yeah, yes. I like that. I like it that to, way. To, yeah. to make it more clear, the names and the, the mm -hmm. title of the, the presentations and so on. Yeah. Yes. We are improving. Every day we improve our material. <laughs> we still have, look, we still have, uh, I, I have a question about this, uh, this, uh, oh, we have a lot of questions of Manuel. Uh, let me ask you the following, about the questions, the, the questions and answers. Um, we can save them. I, the questions. I, I think we can, yes. Yes. I don't know. What happened? Uh, well what, what we can save is if they appear in the in the chat. The chat I can save. Um, but in the question and answer I didn't find an option to save it specially. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'm not seeing an option there either yet. Let me see. Maybe, maybe what we'll have to do is to cup and glue, yeah? Yes. We can maybe. Do that. Yeah, to be sure, yeah? So I will do that now. I have a lot of questions from Manuel Maleiro. So that was good to bring up at the yes. moment. Yeah. We'll hear. Yeah. I will do that because uh, I'm not sure what happened. Oh no, I cannot copy. No, no. No, I have no 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 option for copy. I don't know whether it uh, passed. If, uh, if, if you you can try what I just tried. If you put your cursor on the question and answer and hit Control A. Control A. Yes. yes. Then it highlighted everything. Oh ah, yeah. And then Control C would copy it, and Control V would paste it. To copy paste, yes, to another. Ah, okay. Document. Control Control C, yeah, to copy. Control v to copy and Control V to paste in the new document. Select all. Yes. Ah. Are you trying? Yes. Yes, because th that would be very interesting. But but it, it's. Uh, but you have to select every topic. Ah, yeah. Every topic you have to select. It's a lot of work. Probably they have a way to uh, to to save everything because you have all the questions, you have the answers, and so you cannot save everything. Yeah, yeah. This is something that we have to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I, I just yeah. quickly saved everything in the three categories. There, the open, answered, and dismissed. Mm -hmm. So, so see you, Stephen. Okay. <laughs> so, 
we, we, we have to eat something, yeah? <laughs> yeah. It's that time. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, get yeah. this out. I'll get the, get these uh, invitations out in a little while, and I'll see you in the morning. Okay. 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 Good. Good. Thank you very much. Very good. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Bye bye soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye to all.